This is Digital Music Trends, episode 125, recorded on the 27th of March 2013. This week on the show, Twitter's music strategy, Spotify's ad campaign, the end of downloads as a concept, Justin Timberlake's sales, and reselling digital music. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show bringing you the latest news in the digital music industry. Digital Music Trends is available as both audio and video on iTunes, most podcatchers, SoundCloud, YouTube, Mixcloud, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. And this week on DMT uh, we have two great guests who are both first timers on the show, so that's great. And I'd like to welcome Dave Allen, Director of uh, uh, Interactive Strategy at Brand Agency and Interactive Collective North, uh, as well as of course uh, being founding member uh, and bass player for Gang of Four. So hi Dave and thanks for being on the show how's it going it's going very well and thanks for having me i'm looking forward to chatting with you too great and also a guest on the show today is uh, nikke osterbach from sari music a digital strategy agency that helps labels uh, uh, big and small on all aspects of their digital campaigns so hi nikke great having you on how's it going oh, hey all good here uh, thanks for having me it's great. Uh, so awesome. We can get started. And uh, today's show, as usual, is pretty packed. Uh, actually, we haven't had a regular uh, digital music trends show for the last couple of weeks uh, while the whole South by Southwest madness uh, unraveled. Uh, so I'd like actually to open uh, um, chatting about a news that happened a couple of weeks ago while I, I was at South by Southwest, uh, which uh, interestingly didn't happen at South by Southwest. It came from outside of that. And it, it was uh, something that came out of CNET. Uh, and they revealed that uh, Twitter acquired the music recommendation and discovery service We Are Hunted in late 2012 uh, and is working on creating its own music app that is slated for release quite soon. So uh, CNET in the original article speculated that it could be as early as the end of March that this app comes out, which is uh, supposedly called Twitter Music. Uh, but now two weeks later, you know, it's the 27th, there's only a few days left of March so uh, f- for that prediction to come true really. Um, and whilst uh, there's going to be a standalone app, the whole element uh, of the Twitter music thing is going to be around hashtags so different hashtags to highlight different types of discovery of, of music uh, as to whether it's something you're listening to now something that is uh, popping up uh, as, as becoming popular or something that is already uh, popular um, and the other big big thing about this is that uh, Twitter would uh, include SoundCloud as their uh, primary partner for this uh, Twitter music service. Uh, so so uh, some really interesting stuff coming out of there and Twitter was one of the few companies that we hadn't really heard much from in terms of uh, uh, music and, and music planning. So uh, the first uh, thing that I wanted to, to ask you is, you know, what do you think about Twitter and music recommendations uh, in a vertical with a company like We Are Hunted? Like, what do you think they can achieve on that front? Uh, Nikke, uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think uh, Twitter bought We Are Hunted for the, the way that they process data, I yeah. believe. So I think it's basically it's for them to buy a piece of technology which they feel like they can actually use and plug into their service to then, um, you know, actually show what's popular in their minds. Yeah. Um, whether, like, how good, like, We Are Hunted's technology is, like, that's also up, uh, up for debate. It's kind of, uh, you know, in the same league with, like, hype machines and such, but, like, they have their own algorithm. Yeah. But I think, like, um, crucially with, um, with this uh, piece of news, like, the Twitter music is what's powering the the music which is soundcloud yeah and that that that, that, that's the key thing is like if you're not on soundcloud you're not on twitter music and what does that mean for the service and and crucially i think it's like uh uh how's that like um it's a bit of a hot topic now uh with licensing music and how soundcloud is paying um the copyright holder so i think like (laughs) it, 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 it it's really good as long as their music uh, powering tool SoundCloud works and no one kind of cuts off that power cord. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> you know, Twitter is my, my favorite sort of uh, network, um, given all the, the pop- popular social platforms. Uh, Twitter I use the most, and I've always seen it as a major business tool and, and a major news tool. So, you know, to add on this sort of... Um, music discovery piece is kind of interesting um um i like the connection with soundcloud i uh, soundcloud is i think one of the best ways for uh, artists particularly who own their own copyrights and even some who don't who can just pop things up there for people to discover i i, I i'm really getting a little concerned about how many players are in this space though yeah. um you know i've always believed very strongly um 
perhaps uh, being a little older than you two, I, I, and having had a long career in music, um, I was always very fond of the, the the DJ being the filter for music. You know, so of course the the, um, the top of the pile there was John Peel, um, who um, really got me started in punk rock way back in uh, 1977. Um, you know, just by being that filter, and it was very very exciting. Now what I'm finding now is this flat landscape. Um, where there are no filters, there are no peaks and troughs, there are only, wow, um, you know, 20,000 people like this or tweeted this hashtag today. Um, and, and going back to SoundCloud, though, I think that, and also MixCloud out of the UK, I really, really like that too. They're my two music um, um, services that I like to use the most. Um, and just to finish up here, my thought is... You know, I've often written about on, on, on my blog about the sort of intellectual failure of streaming. It's like if we're only accessing all the same catalogs forever and ever, um, you know, I'm sorry, we, the, the companies, that the, the Spotify's, the Mogs, the RDOs of the world, if they're only able to get the same catalog and the filtering within those platforms is, as I say, fairly flat or crowdsourced, um, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that's really the future of music here. That's just more the uh, a reality that people don't want to own music. They they really just want to rent it or get it for free. Yeah. So uh, it'll be interesting how this pans out with Twitter. Yeah, sure. And uh, Twitter has been actually pretty uh, an, an interesting company in the sense that, for example, they had a fallout with uh, with Instagram, of course, probably because of the involvement of Facebook in the company, and uh, and so people couldn't can't see the images from Instagram straight into the feed anymore. Uh, whilst they actually integrated with SoundCloud uh, with their little widget that is works within Twitter uh, as early as last year, I think. Um, so I, I don't know. Do, do you have any any thoughts as to as to why they might have been open to a company like SoundCloud? Uh, to come in and integrate in that way uh, and I think only YouTube and maybe a couple of other services are actually integrated so deeply into Twitter as, as SoundCloud really. Uh, I don't know, any thoughts? Sorry, I don't want to jump in, but I, oh, I, I mean, I, I don't have any background um, ultimately on why or why not. I mean, I know Alex Young, I, I've met him a few times, he's a very smart business person. So maybe there's something there for SoundCloud yeah. where um, it was definitely a great partnership to put together. Yeah. Because as we've seen anyway, all these partnerships can be ended on a whim. They don't seem to be binding in contracts somehow. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. we're, we've moved now, we're doing this, sorry, we're cutting off all those users. Yeah. And actually, I think that's a little bit of a problem when we we have to consider free services. So Twitter's free, SoundCloud is free to a point, um, especially for the listener. Uh, we're always beholden to, we might wake up one morning and SoundCloud has either gone away or Twitter's gone away or they've been you know, sold to another company that yeah. um, redefines them. So I, we're at the mercy of this all the time, both artists and and users. And, and Nick, uh, they've made a really good point there that uh, usually Twitter is able to end partnerships like these uh, fairly easily. Uh, but if they do integrate SoundCloud at a deeper level within their own music recommendation services, uh, services that that is a big win for SoundCloud because it means that they can't really get out of being partners with them that easily anymore, right? Well, I, I think like um, basically back to the point of like uh, if we accept the fact that like uh, you have to be copyright licensed by the majors and, and the indies to be able to be a successful music service, that means that like, you know, ultimately I think you have to back a service which has the blessing of the copyright holders. Yeah. And uh, wh uh, whether we, you know, agree with that or not, uh, that's another thing. But then I, I kind of feel like as long as SoundCloud are fine with uh, with the copyright holders, then you know it's going to be fine on Twitter. But then, if Twitter integrate deeper with SoundCloud, then it also means that like they're you know they're putting you know SoundCloud as the preferred service over other services, whatever else. Yeah. Uh, which then kind of you know puts them into one other camp. Uh, Facebook obviously like you know integrated audio and um, Spotify and MOG early on. And that kind of puts Facebook into the camp of like, you know, we want to promote the services which, you know, like are, have the blessing of, you know, like this major copyright holder. So I think like everything kind of depends on how those conversations develop. Yeah. 
Yeah, of course. And uh, talking about uh, sort of the usual uh, streaming services, uh, Spotify had a couple of interesting news this week. And uh, the first and most impactful one, I think, uh, especially for you in the US, Dave, is that the service uh, has now launched its first large scale ad campaign uh, on mainstream media, which is valued at $10 million, apparently, in, in ad spend. So uh, we often need to remind ourselves on the show, like because we're talking to digital media people and digital music people, how much in a bubble we are, you know, given certain services for, for granted, uh, forgetting that a lot of uh, people I- in the mainstream audience are probably not as familiar with streaming or how it works as uh, as we are and, uh, and and so this is an attempt to, to bring uh, spotify to the mainstream which is something that uh, on the show we talk about a lot how you bring streaming into uh, to mainstream consumers uh, and uh, they actually debuted the, the first advert uh, during the uh, premiere of the voice so a very relevant show for for music fans uh, uh, that would be uh, part of a mainstream audience uh, and uh, it kind of matches uh, to what Ardio did uh, at the tail, ad, uh, tail end of uh, 2012 where they had like a, a bunch of like big billboards going up uh, especially in New York there were loads and loads of audio billboards to create awareness on the company so the, f- the first question is uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the adverts themselves uh, have you had a chance to check them out uh, uh, Nikke uh, yeah I saw the advert and like you know it's um, <laughs> it, it's playing to the emotional side of music I think it's kind of a uh, it's positioning like Spotify as like the music lover service so yeah. like the the ad looks good um, I think with, with the strategy of actually like, you know, it, it, it is newsworthy that Spotify are actually advertising on TV. Yeah. But then, uh, and I think like they are now, you know, actually going to reach a new, you know, a, a whole new segment of people who wouldn't be aware of them so far. I remember like reading reading a, an article a couple of months back with like, which basically detailed of like the the U.S. consumers of like how many hours you watch TV versus use the internet. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it was like YouTube versus uh, TV watching. It was like three and a half hours against like 15 minutes or five minutes or something. Oh, so wow. it's like, you know, to me, it's like, you know, getting in touch with like basically the, the majority of the consumers still in, in, in many ways. Yeah. Uh, and so, Dave, any thoughts on the adverts yourself? Yeah, I, you know, um, I find it odd when web companies advertise. I, I, you know, I, again, this is a bubble thing. So in 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 my industry and and uh, uh, um, Nickus, um, you, you know, the 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 idea of when Facebook put up that ad, you know, uh, the chair ad, um, and it was really interesting. With my students that I teach at the University of Oregon, were completely puzzled by it. Um, I just wonder. Does this reach the mainstream um, in a better way, or is it some kind of desperation because the there's been a, a sort of a, a cap? You know, it, it's leveled out. Uh, the the new user take up is leveled out, and and how many people are actually wanting to be part of a service that you either pay to get away from the ads in the stream or you put up with the ads in the stream so i just wonder how big the audience actually is for a streaming music service um and then um you know uh, we're hearing rumblings that apple's going to jump into this arena google's going to jump into the arena google's already there with youtube which is the um the from all the uh, research i've done uh, uh um I've discovered, and I think many people know, that the number one channel is YouTube for discovering music. Um, And artists use it really effectively, and it's absolutely free. Um, So I'm not sure about um, a $10 million media spend. That's great for the agency involved. Uh, I don't know how good it is for uh, Spotify, and I don't know how good it is for music fans ultimately to become more aware. I would rather hope that, uh, like... You know, if you think of some successful web companies like, say, Dropbox or Evernote and all, you know, you don't need to advertise. It's basically word of mouth says, this is awesome. This is how I use it. It's free. Go ahead and use it. Um, So I suppose I'm really going around in a circle saying I'm scratching my head as to why they feel the need to advertise currently, unless it's a threat from the bigger companies jumping in with much deeper pockets, not not backed by uh, Silicon Valley investment companies but purely profitable, you know, cash deep. Um, We'll see. We'll see how it goes. 
Yeah, I mean, my main reservation on the Albert itself is that uh, I'm just wondering, you know, it's a it's it's a completely brand awareness advert in the sense that there's there's nothing as to how the service works or what it really is. It just talks about the power of music and then it says Spotify at the end. And so uh, m- m- my main thought is if the aim is to reach mainstream consumers that might not really know about the service or what it does, is that effective in that way just as a brand awareness exercise or it should have gone a little bit more boring, I guess, but just I- I- into explaining a little bit about what the service does from the ground? Uh, I don't know. Well, not necessarily. I mean... Um you know, really, you're talking to a person who works in an advertising and branding agency that yeah, exactly. doesn't really. But I don't really touch advertising and branding. Mm-hmm. I, I, I always, my job is to think about the users and what the users are doing. So I don't necessarily work on behalf of our clients. I work on behalf of their customers. Okay. Um, so th- there's the rub, I suppose. What, what is the audience for streaming music? currently in the United States and then the rest of the world. You know, what are those numbers? What is the margin between who's taking it up already and who's just happily still purchasing music on iTunes and don't care about streaming? Um, I don't believe in 2013 there must there, there can't there can't be a massive audience of people who don't understand the term streaming they may not understand the sort of arrangements like the subscription piece the you know yeah, the, yeah. the 999 a month whatever it is um they get confused when Pandora cuts you back to 40 hours a month, for instance, when you're happily just charging along listening to music. I, I think I think what we need is, is probably a real consumer awareness campaign more than a, a brand strategy from any of these companies. Yeah. And then having said that, as soon as Google, say, jumps in, you you know it's sort of game over in a sense then if you're happily using uh, youtube for listening to music or you're an apple fan and you like itunes and it comes up with the same catalogs that everyone else has and you can just stream through your itunes player on your mobile device particularly then wow you know um all of this is meaningless after a while like the branding aspect of spotify we'll just see where it goes i, I mean uh, I, I'm just. I think the musician side of me is 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 rather is rather bored with the conversation. To be honest, yeah, it's yeah. like nothing. Nothing has moved the needle. It's just giving everyone free access to music consistently globally, and that is not a sustainable business model. Yeah. So yeah. we'll just see. Yeah. And Nika, did you have any reservation on on that front in terms of uh, the the just branding exercise of the adverts uh, versus explaining what the company does? Well, like, uh, it's difficult to say when you're not actually part of those conversations uh, with the relevant parties, but, like, it wouldn't be too far off, like, uh, if someone would have just, like, you know, said in a meeting that, like, well, you're not even advertising on TV, and that causes, like, you know, basically uh, shaky pants for Spotify, that, like, we have to be driving on this area as well. So, like, you really don't know what those what those kind of conversations are. Um, like, they are you're not trying to brand Spotify as like this music lover service. Um, but yeah, but yeah, on the kind of wider perspective, I suppose this year is going to be interesting, uh, not only for like, you know, having a lot of like different kind of uh, small scales, small scale players yeah. entering, this, not, not entering this space, but like actually uh, getting some steam uh, yeah. on, under their, under their operations. But then crucially, like if, if iTunes launch something, uh, uh, then, like, uh, and everything that's happening with, like, Google, with YouTube, uh, whatever is going to happen in that space, how is Google going to be tied in with Google Play, uh, and YouTube, and so on. So, it's an interesting year for sure, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and uh, another story that is uh, related to Spotify was just I wanted to look at it quickly because it's not it's not that relevant it's just a rumor but uh, it, it's interesting because there's, there's a tie up with, with another service that's doing a similar thing so uh, Spotify has been rumored by Business Insider to be looking at adding a video a streaming service to their to their music service uh, and for sure looking at you know the numbers from Netflix and Amazon that must uh, look like a pretty enticing field to move into and of course there's two questions here the first one is associated to uh, uh, you know the the 
brand association, as we were just talking about. You know, Spotify is working really hard to brand itself uh, as a music lover service. If, if they were to uh, move into a, a video, that would be, I think, f- relatively con- uh, confusing to consumers. Um, especially in the US where there's you know very established brands on that front with with Netflix for example and on the other side is also a, a content deals money very practical side where you know making deals for for video content is hugely expensive and uh, I'm not sure how how much money they would need to actually be able to strike those deals and have a compelling ca- catalog to present uh, to uh, to the um, to the consumers. Uh, on the other side, you know, you've got a service like Audio that uh, kind of in the background has still got this uh, sort of secondary company called Video uh, that uh, has merged some of its operations with Audio in terms of uh, admin uh, and and hasn't really quite done much yet uh, on that front. But it, Audio has also got that potential of being a dual service on both the the audio and the video front uh, so i don't know like uh, what do you guys think on, on, on in terms of moving from one space into the other uh, do you think this rumor ha- has any possibility of being of being true or and would it make sense for spotify to move into this this uh, different space i don't know dave i have no idea i, I it just seems like everything's a crowded space and yeah. uh, but you know if spotify well, let, let me just step back there. Like you mentioned it yourself, Andrea. Uh, it, it, you know, you're up against uh, YouTube. You're up against Netflix. You're up against Amazon. Um, again, profitable companies. Um, and you're trying to, if this is true, if the rumor is true, they want to now try and be more than just a music streaming service. It it seems like an interesting way to be spending a lot of money, and, and I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what the end result might be. Um, and if their investors are, cause, you know, because we know they're not profitable, right? So if their investors are happy going out and getting licenses for all this mu- uh, music videos, then fabulous. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's kind of yeah like uh, for what I understand is that was like lifted at least what like musical I reported today is like they said that that was lifted from Daniel X uh, 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 his talk where he had said like you know that there are you know they're not ruling anything out and then yeah. this article was basically lifted from the base of that that like they're going into battle with Netflix. Oh. So, yeah. like, in, yeah. uh, in in reality I think. Uh, they've got like enough in their hands trying to get like you know you know the copyright holders paid and then crucially like getting the you know the publishers paid yeah. that's a yeah. quite, quite a gray area for what I understand is like how is it actually working like whose music is being used and are the songwriters getting paid so it's kind of a I think without going into the more yeah, on their plate I think they're gonna kind of, should first kind of figure out the music side of things yeah yeah, of course. And uh, uh, so moving on to from this, because of course, you know, it was reported uh, as a as uh, you know unnamed sources and, and that kind of uh, kind of kind of thing and, and it was really a, just a refreshed rumor that had been going around from last year uh, but moving on from this into into uh, something more tangible there was an interesting interview uh, between uh, these are CEOs Axel Doshe with uh, with Stuart Dredge uh, that was published on the Guardian's website and along amongst many points on mobile partnerships and user behaviors uh, he he also talked about the idea of downloads as a concept dying uh, in 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 this coming year uh, so not in terms of volumes of course yet and he didn't go as far as making a prediction on that front uh, but he did talk about you know how the actual concept of downloads uh, may be uh, in its last steps uh, so that's interesting like just looking at it uh, he compared it to downloads uh, so, sorry to, he compared this to Microsoft Exchange and how uh, sort of the concept of exchange died when Gmail came about and, and started getting traction with the public. So I don't know, it, it, uh, do, do you feel this is a, an interesting point on, on the way downloads are going uh, on, on, at this stage? Even though, of course, they're making up still like a huge bulk of, of the music industry revenues, especially especially in the US by, by now. Uh, well, w- um, w- are they really making up a huge bulk of revenues? I mean, as a percentage of what was lost, it's it's not really coming back. Yeah. Um, um, 
I, I think what we have to look at here is, and you know, the, the Microsoft Exchange versus Gmail analogy is interesting. It's, it's. We always have to consider the user, and we always have to look at the social construct. You know, where the social construct is something that doesn't need to be set into law. It's just what people begin to do. Society kind of then moves in that in that manner towards it, and it just becomes a sort of a thing. You know, it's a thing that is happening. And I said it earlier in this in this podcast. Um, um, we, people just don't want to buy music. So, you know, there's a challenge there when Spotify or Pandora, uh, any of these streaming services, um, suggest that they are for music discovery, and that's how the artists are going to get paid. Um, I really call BS on that because it's like if you're in a music streaming service that you don't pay for and you can just continue to stream the artists you've discovered, why would you hop off and go download the, a track or pay for a track and download it? Um, so in a mobile world, which we have to add, accept is where we are now, um, it's not so easy to just go out and download music um, as it is if you're sitting at home on a desktop or a laptop. So they could be right. You know, the Guardian article might be uh, it might be true that we'll see a drop off in downloading of music, but I don't know what the timeline is, what the expectation is for that. I wouldn't say it's going to end anytime soon, but we might see it drop down to a long tail situation where some people still stick to downloading. Others, um, as I'll keep uh, expressing, really is. Uh, everyone, I believe, the majority, when I say everyone, will want to just yeah. keep getting convenient yeah. access yeah. to music yeah. for free. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, we have to change that. We have to do something about that. Otherwise, there won't be any new music because uh, there will be no money in it for the artists. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. Uh, Nick, any thoughts on that? Um, well, I think like... Uh, uh, something that kind of gets to me a bit, like not being, not being from the UK or you know, like US, is that like, like the it should always be like specified in these articles. And when we start discussing, is like, what uh, are we talking about? The world? Are we talking about like you know? Are we talking about like Ghana? Are we talking about Finland or whatever? And yeah. here, basically, the article is referring to like uh, the Western. Western cultures where, like, you know, iTunes was highly adopted because uh, Apple decided to pursue these markets at a specific point. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, in, 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 in the Nordic countries, you, you missed, like, a lot of, like, basically, in, in my home, who could have become iTunes downloaders because there was no... Uh, no service that was heavily promoted for the consumers. So people went from Streaming, streaming. Uh, illegal streaming, and then now uh, to legal streaming. So it's kind of a, what's always kind of I think everyone discussing these things is like uh, as as they said, like you know, it's it's really kind of a, it's about adoption, and people will steer into the most convenient model when they are aware of it. But then also, like when you have like the coach, you know, when you have enough peers who adopt that approach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, you know, if all of your friends are on Facebook, you're forced to go on Facebook. Like, like similar kind of methodologies, I suppose, with like streaming or how you consume music. But then, um, yeah, so I think, like, like um, maybe, maybe, like, uh, in certain countries, there's like a zeitgeist happening with certain segments of consumers uh, who use iTunes consumers. <laughs> To the streaming services, or at least the percentage of those people, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and also, that also with like, you know, is it more convenient to stay on iTunes, and you know, if you have all your devices on iOS? Yeah. So yeah. you know, all, all, all these factors have an have an effect, and um, this, yeah, yeah, partly probably true, but also you know, only speaks about the very tiny segment of the music consumers, the global yeah. I think that you make some great points there, um, especially about the audience and and in in what countries. You know, we, we, we if we live in Europe or United States or, or uh, I'll count Britain as site, you know, an island off the coast of Europe. Um, we tend to think in terms of the internet audience being massive, uh, but if we look to Asia, um, you know, a population of four billion people or more, um, and uh, 
billions of them are online. We, we need to look at what they're doing. I, I, I think it's a good point. Are they downloading music or are they using streaming services? Because, um, you know, the internet audience is shifting. The U.S. is coming down in rank of users. Um, you know, out of, a, out of a, a population of 350 million, I think we have 293 million users online currently. We really can't get many more than that because our population growth isn't bursting by out of the seams. Um, and anyone who isn't using the internet or um, uh, mobile smartphones, for instance, um, is either way too young or way too old and can't be bothered. So th there's a dem demographic problem uh, going to occur pretty soon in the West, I think, where the audience reach is going to be small. Now, I mention that because, you know, there's always this idea that, okay, in the United States, if there's 350 million, so let's call it 300 million people with, with a credit card or the ability to buy something from the web from these music services, that belies a truth in that not many people not many. buy CDs in the past, right? I think it was something like seven a year. When I was at Intel in, in uh, 99 through 2001, I saw a lot of research that showed the average person bought two or three CDs a year. Um, it's, it's the outliers that buy 20 to 30 CDs a year back then. I think it's the outliers that uh, use all the multiple streaming services to um, you know uh, partake of. And that is a tiny niche audience compared to mass. So going back to Spotify and advertising, uh, and maybe they're trying to reach mass, but I'm not sure that, you know, if, if Michael Jackson sold 60 million copies of Thriller in the United States, that was probably the maximum music audience at the time, right? It had to be. It was like everybody had that record. Yeah. Um, so how many people are actually avid consumers of music? How many people want to stream or download? These are, this is research that needs to be done. And I think we need, I, I agree with like, you know, Ben Cicero is a good friend of mine, but the article I read this morning, I want to get with him offline and go, wow, there's so many missing pieces to that story that we, we need to talk about are we where are we talking as Nick has said uh, is it just the US or is it uh, what we call majority world now um, the, the bigger Asian audiences yeah uh, okay so let's take a, a, a little a break from sort of serious uh, uh, serious conversations and talk about Justin Timberlake I just wanted to do a quick a quick break <laughs> on that as, as I have a couple of uh, people that that are really good at uh, talking about digital campaigns and, and that side of things. So, uh, you know, he uh, just reached the, the, the mark of almost a million sales uh, from, from the past uh, week. Uh, so first week sales in the US, which is, a, which is quite a high number. And uh, of course, there are very few albums that are, are reaching that level now. But I wanted to ask you guys, so how do you approach a campaign for an artist of that, of that size uh, these days when you're looking at... Uh, at the digital front because of course he did a lot of like frontline appearances on on you know tv shows and on, on the usual stuff but on the digital side when you look at an artist of that size and uh, uh and you want to do a campaign based around that is there anything in particular that is a staple for you that needs to be done absolutely and that is a priority uh Nikkei, maybe i'll start with you because you have a lot of experience on that on that front um do, do you mean like uh uh, is there anything to learn from that campaign? Yeah, I mean, is there anything that struck you about that campaign? And, uh, you know, m more generally, is there anything that, you know, is, is replicable for, for uh, similar sized artists on that front? Yeah, like uh, what I would say, like there's nothing, I haven't seen anything that hasn't been done before. Yeah, It's like pre-streaming on iTunes, like uh, playing, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like the pockets of, you know, the people uh, who were his, you know, like, who are his long time music consumers. Yeah. And yeah. that's what they've done. And I think that the sales reflect of who he is and who his fan base has been all those years. Like, probably the one of the perfect, you know, iTunes artists to launch a new album on in, in many ways, especially in the US. Yeah. But, like, yeah, um, what happened, what's I suppose the talking point is like, the, the MySpace tie-in and how they yeah. used, like, you know, how, how they used to push like the whole of my MySpace as a, you know, ad advertising screen for his new record coming out. Yeah. Um, and uh, the experience on the new MySpace wasn't too good when that happened. So I don't know what it says about like his his ability to like invest into music, the technology. I don't know, but like, yeah, like personally, I, I haven't seen anything. Uh, I, I think it's basically a, quite a traditional marketing campaign. Yeah. yeah. 
which has been kind of thought in with iTunes in mind. Yeah, sure. That's quite, like, traditional. Yeah, traditional. And, and uh, of course, like you, you would even wonder if he lost some sales by pushing MySpace so hard or as hard as it did. Like uh, uh, at South by Southwest, you actually had to subscribe to, like you had to log into MySpace to be able to even attempt to get a ticket for the gig that he was playing there. So still really, really pushing that, that side of things. Uh, Dave, do you think that that could have been a detrimental to his, <laughs> to his sales? Well, uh, I, I, I don't. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, it's fine. Hey, hey. Like, yeah, basically, I, I don't think it made him look like, you know, a, a savvy tech investor for sure. Yeah. But like, you know, uh, at, at the kind of macro scale, does it really matter? I, I don't think so. I think like he, he's winning with the model that they picked. And, you know, I'm sure radio is playing like in the US and, you know, videos are flying off the YouTube shelves and like, you know, um, of course, but yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think it hurt his sales. I mean, if, if he's done a million first week, um, presumably that's a mix of um, analog and digital sales. Um, he's a very respected artist, uh, you know, amongst his crowd. They, 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 they've, they've grown up with him in a sense, you know, from Disney Mouseketeer to international superstar. Yeah. Um, and I agree with Nicky. I, I didn't see anything absolutely uh, stunningly different, I have to say. So, uh, Just good a luck standard to him. campaign. Standard, yeah, standard uh, but not. It, it's standard these days in that he has his clothing company. Um, it's not quite so standard that he invested in MySpace. But yeah. other, I don't think I, <laughs> yeah. I don't think the MySpace piece matters at all. Yeah. No, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's just that his fans went out and bought his record week one. Let's see what week two looks like. But he's done pretty well for himself. Yeah. And, and and in a sense, I, I I begin to think these days it's rather like the Rolling Stones back in the nineties. You just put a record out to go on tour and and make money around the release, not because of the release. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's let's close that quickly and uh, uh, talk about. Um, one more streaming service before we close here. And so it's a, a service called Song, Songle, uh, which is uh, um, based in Australia. Uh, it launched officially in Australia out of beta with some controversies related to uh, the non-signing of, of independence via, via Maryland, but we can leave that aside for now. Uh, and the thing that I want to talk about was the fact that Songle is another, yet another streaming service that is entering a very crowded marketplace in Australia, which is now, has got Ardio, Spotify, Deezer, Rara, uh, JB Hi-Fi Now, Sony Music Unlimited, and many more competitors for attention in a small market it's even smaller than the US it's uh, 22 million people the population uh, although it's an important territory because it's, it was ranked as the sixth biggest music market by the IFPI in 2011 even if they have such a small population so uh, you know th they are trying to differentiate themselves as providing curation by a network of DJs uh, uh, from a, a network called Southern Cross Austereo, which is, I guess, the biggest uh, radio network in Australia. And, and uh, these DJs are going to provide playlists uh, for the for the service and all, the, all, all that sh uh, shebang. Uh, but, you know, on, on that level, you know, really, it's just another streaming service. Do you think we're, we're going to see outliers from uh, you know, uh, different territories that are not the UK and the US come in and 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 maybe be able to grab a piece of the market uh, in, in their particular uh, region. I don't know, uh, Nikke. Yeah, well, um, well, I, I kind of feel that the, the global, like, first of all, like, there's the you know, the, there's the dark horse of like Google and I, you know, iTunes, Apple, what they're gonna do. Yeah. Um, but then, like, uh, if we put those aside and we have the kind of the services which are pure music subscription services, are all going to try to be in that space, like audios and Spotify's. Um, I think, like, with those services, like the kind of uh, there's going to be a few key players, and those probably depend a lot of like which are the chosen ones for the the I you know the the ones who partner with ISPs, telco labels a, a big indies so i think like few 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 of these services will be chosen by the industry to be pushed uh, as the key services and those are going to be the ones that, that are going to survive yeah um the the you know that the point about like not placing indie music is obviously to me like it's not a it's not a music service worth paying for it yeah. it doesn't yeah. have like you know as much music as legally possible mm. well, well yeah, i mean emusic.com is a is still a niche uh, music service um 
Uh, and just to be open here, uh, I, I was uh, an early member of the team back in the late 90s that, that was working to get more and more catalogs from the labels. Um, it was very hard. So we ended up with a, a really huge catalog of independent music. So that that's today is doing pretty well just in that niche. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, uh, otherwise, if it's just another streaming service, uh, I'm not sure that moves the needle. I'll, I'll keep this one short. It's like, yeah. I'm not wildly interested in it. No, no, exactly. It's, a, it's kind of a... It feels like there's a you know maybe somebody that came. It's been in beta for a while, and and it, it does feel like a little bit like a service that is coming a, a, a little bit too late, especially once. I mean, if you come in like a service like Simfy in Germany, um, and uh, Simfy came into Germany uh, as. Uh, there were no other streaming services uh, there. You know, there was no Spotify, n none of that. So they managed to build a fairly, fairly big audience uh, over there before the other services came into play. But if you go into a market as a new service that is local and is competing with uh, some of the larger companies, I think it's going to be pretty difficult to to actually make a, make a dent into into the population, uh, especially if a lot of your friends are using different ones. I mean, it's the, the question of interoperability is a huge one right now um, for streaming as well. And uh, uh, so I uh, just wanted to touch on uh, the question of uh, uh, the Red DG case, uh, just uh, as, as a byline, you know, especially looking at that Dave's perspective, perspective uh, uh, of it from, from, from the US. So this, the Supreme Court on the 19th of March actually ruled in favor of a student that was having his friends and relatives buy textbooks in Thailand and resell them in the US. Why is that relevant for music? Well, uh, it's because it basically creates a precedent uh, on the first sale doctrine. So uh, the, the, the question of whether you can sell or otherwise dispose of, of an asset uh, without the permission of the copyright owner um, in, in, a, in a digital in a digital uh, sense of course uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, an interpretation of the Supreme Court of the first sale doctrine which uh, will be interesting uh, for uh, the music uh, side because Redigi of course has got an open case with uh, uh, Capitol Records and the judges have been really quiet uh, there's been no really worry about what's happening with that um, at the moment uh, and uh, I spoke to to a lawyer at South by Southwest there's an interview on online as well uh, where you know everybody's kind of keeping quiet about making a decision on this because it's a huge decision to make uh, for for the industry not just for the music uh, side but also for software for videos for all sorts of other different media I mean of course m m my my main takeaway from it is that even if music does end up being a commodity that can be resold online uh, digitally uh, the, the point is always that the market for this is going to be relatively small I mean it's going to be pretty difficult for for a service to really become huge by reselling digital music i don't i don't know how much of a need from consumers there is to for that to happen but uh but just uh, in general terms uh, and also with the ready g coming into europe so that's from from nick's point uh dave what what, what are your thoughts on you know the first sale uh provisions uh, in, in u.s copyright law and uh, whether this will be applied to digital goods or not in the near future in the states um well first of all i think as we said in in email uh, before we jumped on the show, uh, we're not copyright experts, I, yeah. I believe, yeah. right? And I'm yeah. certainly not a copyright expert. Yeah. But um, what we do know is, like, with music, uh, it tends to be licensed to the person who buys it. You don't all the results. You have certain rights to do certain things with it. <clears throat> um, but that aside, again, I don't, I don't think the most peaceful in the world understand that. Concept, that that bought a CD, for instance, or you downloaded the album yeah. on iTunes, and you don't really, really have a license to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Historically, with the used record stores, you know, when they were reselling CDs that were dropped off by radio promo people um, to sale, in the stores, there was a bit of a go around there trying to um, put put those out of business, but it, you know, if anything, it, it increased the uh, expansion of the music industry somewhat because more and more people got access to music a little bit cheaper. Um, uh, I was talking to Rick Moody in email, uh, Moody the author, and he, you know, he's sort of horrified about uh, books uh, being resold by consumers. But I think you hit on the head. I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure I would get, get personally into the market of selling my music downloads for like one cent uh, in bundles to people to make like seven dollars or something. But perhaps the, the onus uh, where the law's concerned is going to be on a company like Redigi, which is aggregating this and wants to create a service to do it. Um, and as a musician and, and someone who sides with musicians are trying to get um, trying to be involved in the financial transaction, this just sounds like something again which will um, um, sort of further lower our royalty income stream, uh, especially in the United States. Uh, I'm not complaining about my my um, income streams for, for my music sales abroad because each country has different laws. So Europe is pretty tight in paying for what we call needle time, for instance, and yeah. making sure that we're compensated. But, you know, Gang of Four, is very popular in the music streaming services and in the download uh, services, but you get very, very little royalties because of the cuts that they're getting their hands on. This is not, you know, whatever happens to DJ, it's not a good thing um, for music in general, I don't believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. of course. Of course. Yeah, I suppose like uh, it's the, the, the whole debate, which I'm like, again, like I'm not a copyright lawyer. I've, you know, I'm not like you know, an expert of the global copyright law, but like uh, I suppose that there is that fact that like, uh, what are you actually, are you actually owning music if you buy it from iTunes, uh, a license, is that ownership? So, you know, how do we view own ownership? Yeah. And then also it's like, if I sell, if I can sell a track, a digital track, surely then it would, it would kind of have to mean that like, I don't have that track anymore myself. Yeah. But then if I pass that track to another person for the internet, like, like copies are being made just by the default that how, how the internet works. Yeah. So, you know, pickled, like, you know, feel to even kind of put onto like uh, legal terms, I suppose. Like, I think uh, the legislation will always catch up on these things. Um, personally, I think like it's a bit of a silly concept of selling, being able to sell your digital files because like who, who can tell like you know if you actually have it still or not like how, how would you facilitate that yeah exactly yeah. i mean uh, unless uh, the, this feature had been built into the systems a bit like yeah but then i suppose like uh, uh, amazon are saying i think that like if you would sell tracks on their system you can track that you don't have that track anymore yeah but that's just like if you bought the track on amazon and i suppose what if you change uh, what if you take a track <coughs> or hard drive your external hard drive and you take it back to your hard drive and whatever like you know it's all kind of a if you take it to the cloud is it then going to detect that file from the cloud which might yeah. be behind a password for your google documents or imac cloud or whatever so i mean like i think it's a bit of a silly thing to be think about selling a completely foolproof yeah. that yeah. like people have actually deleted their chats or like, you know that file has completely left that person's domain yeah yeah exactly and uh well uh, i think uh, at this point we should wrap it up uh we're closing to an hour and so i just wanted to ask you guys uh for, first of all is there anything that you'd like to plug in terms of like a, or any campaign that you're running anything exciting that's going on your end that you'd like to talk about uh, uh Nikkei, anything your end um well uh what i might well what would i say to that like uh, um, well, I'm working on the Paramore campaign, that's for Atlantic Records, awesome. for the UK campaign. So anything digital that's happening there. Uh, I'm also working for the, the Fright and Rabbit has been a campaign that I'm quite proud of being, being involved through Atlantic. Yeah. Boxer Rebellion for ATC management, that's oh, a complete do-it-yourself uh, campaign by the manager Summit. So I'm happy to be involved with that. Uh, the new Mike Skinner project, DOT, is something we're building a really cool, cool app uh, around the kind of notion of uh, how we all lie. Cool. Cool. <laughs> they, uh, they're, they're single track, so there, there should be a fun app coming from there. Great. Awesome. And Dave, anything you're on? Yeah, we don't do as much uh, music, clearly, as, as Nick and his company is doing. Um, uh, we've, we've just had uh, a, a great deal of success with our uh, Pitchfork campaign for um, Deschutes River Recordings, which is um, our brand, one of our brand clients, Deschutes Brewery, which is one of the biggest craft breweries in America. Um, we handpicked, uh, sorry, um, their their fans, uh, the beer fans, handpicked three um, independent artists to 
cover songs uh, literally we filmed on the river in uh, the Deschutes River in Oregon and we you know we did the usual uh, big media campaign with Pitchfork yeah, uh, yeah. A, a YouTube channel that's been doing extremely well awesome. um, right now I don't know what's in the works for the next music project but um, we, we we're not you know we have a lot of musicians who work here uh, and actually uh, I'm on the board of cash music dot uh, oh, um, yeah which is um, uh, we're you know we're trying to solve this problem for musicians to get paid and on Monday uh, next Monday here in in the office um, the because it's based in Portland we're getting the, the team here where uh, North is going to work with them pro bono to really escalate this program because uh, you know we've been sitting back for a little while because it hasn't been ready for prime time now we feel that it's really getting there that's great and yeah if you can send me a link uh, I'll throw that in the show notes uh, as well as uh, uh, your uh, Twitters and you know respective co respective companies websites well it was absolutely great having you on the show thanks so much for, for being on uh, we had a few echo difficulties but I think everything else worked out in the end thank you so much thank you very much thank you very much nice to meet you yeah, and thank you, Andrea. And remember to subscribe to DMT's weekly newsletter to stay on top of the latest shows. You'll find the form on digitalmusictrends.com.